We've come this morning to part five in our series, Angels and Demons, and uh, I've enjoyed studying for this series. I've enjoyed presenting on this series. I hope you're enjoying it as we walk through it as well. I've had comments back from several of you that it's of particular interest to you, so uh, I'm glad for that. At the same time, I'm kind of reminded of Jesus when he was talking to Nicodemus, and he said, you know, if I've told you about earthly things and you didn't understand, how are you going to understand if I tell you of heavenly things? And when we start thinking about heavenly things, I'm just kind of like, Ooh, you know, um, but we want to take away from this the encouragement we can have in God's presence around us, the unfailing nature of his plan and purpose, and what he's doing. And so I think it's a beautiful thing for us to look at. You know, we launched into this series on the idea that there are a lot of ideas, a lot of images, a lot of um, information, I guess, about the spiritual world within the culture. Uh, Lots of artwork, lots of um, different things, and folklore and fantasy. It appears in, you know, gaming platforms and, and classic art and all kinds of things around the way. But it's probably not what the Bible has to say, right? So it was a good opportunity for us to jump in and say, yeah, angels and demons are real, but let's separate the fact from the fiction and look at what Scripture has to say. And so today we uh, come around looking at another particular aspect that was definitely a question for me in studying Scripture over the years and different things to understand better, and hopefully it'll uh, speak to you today as well. You know, among the many references to angels throughout Scripture, there is a unique and specific reference recurring through the Old Testament, a reference to the angel of the Lord. As we've seen, the terms angel and demon are very generic in a sense, and they're only really very vaguely sufficient to describe the supernatural heavenly beings that we're reading about and that we're discussing. And this particular angel is far beyond anything that we have seen. Who is the angel of the Lord? You know, the word angel, as I'm talking about it being generic, the word angel itself, both in the Hebrew where it's malak or in the Greek where it's angelos, simply means messenger. Hardly adequate, like I said, for the things we've been discussing, and in this case in particular. But the references around the angel of the Lord themselves begin to reveal the nature and the character of this particular heavenly being, and I think you'll find it interesting today. Now, I want to give you a little um, precursor to this in talking about the idea of the challenges of translation. You know, it's been my privilege to study scripture for a long time, from undergrad to my, my first graduate study was in biblical studies, and I enjoy it. I like it. Uh, at the same time, there are many challenges in translation. One would think that, well, you just translate one word from one language into one word in another language, one at a time, and just boom, 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 there you go. But it really doesn't work that way. In fact, quite often, uh, there is a word in a language that there is no word for that in another language. You know, and I experienced that in contemporary languages as well. Working as a missionary in Thailand and learning to read, write, and speak Thai, there were challenges in that. You, you try to translate in your brain, you know, and you're thinking about stuff. But there can be really awesome words in one language that you just don't have in the other. You have to, like, give a whole sentence to explain it. One of my favorites in Thai was Grang Jai. If you could wrap your head around Grang Jai, you would love it because it encompasses all kinds of awkward feelings that we have. You know, when you feel beholden to somebody for a gift, you feel Grang Jai. When you feel uh, like you don't want to ask for something because you're imposing, you feel Grang Jai. When you feel, you know, all these different range of feelings that we just don't have a single word like that. You know, it's awesome. I would love to have uh, a single word like that. It's very useful. But we run into that same kind of idea uh, in biblical translation. And so there are challenges in in translating words. And even along with that, there are variations sometimes in the translators when they bring something across, down to things that we don't really think about that are very simple, like the use of an article. Now, back to English lessons in school, an article, we have an indefinite article and a definite article. The indefinite article is A or an, an apple, a circle, whatever. And then we have a definite article, the. When we use a definite article, it becomes specific. Not just an apple, but the apple. 
the one that's sitting right there. So it becomes specific in what you're talking about. In translation in scripture, that's something that becomes significant. And when you go back and look at the original language, noting whether there is a definite article there, as in the angel of the Lord, as opposed to an angel of the Lord, becomes significant in what you're looking at. Now, I wanted to encourage you today as well. I think I've mentioned this before, but it's worth mentioning again. Please remember that any English Bible is a translation. Okay? Any English Bible is a translation. And I've seen people almost go to blows in the church about what translation, uh, English translation of the Bible they were going to read. Can I tell you today that while the Word of God is sacred and the Word of God is holy, any English Bible you hold in your hands is a translation. Okay, and we hold to the fact that the scriptures in their original autographs, the original stuff that was written in Hebrew and great and Greek, is inspired and it's inerrant, and we hold to that. But if you don't read Hebrew or Greek, it's very valuable, in fact, for you to look at multiple translations in English to really get a full sense of the meaning of what's there. And not to get hung up on particular words. One thing I find often when we have a favorite translation that we like to look at is we get really hung up on individual words that may, they may use a, a different word in a different translation. And when you are translating, words have a range of meaning. And so there are oftentimes some varieties of things that you can do in that. But I just want to encourage you, don't get hung up in that. And I would actually encourage you to read from multiple English translations, particularly if you're studying something. Uh, You've likely noticed I use a variety of English translations when I teach. New International Version, New Living Translation, English Standard Version, even King James from time to time. King James is a great translation. I don't often use it because it's 500 years old. And I spend a lot of time when I use it explaining how that word was used in English 500 years ago as opposed to how it's used in English today. So I like modern translations. I love the beauty and the poetry of King James. It's a beautiful translation of the Bible, and it stood the test of time. It's fantastic. But again, it's a translation. The newer translations I use, you'll notice I use New International Version a lot. The reason I do that is because the New International Version is written at an eighth grade level of comprehension. That means it's at the most likely point that whoever I'm speaking to is going to understand that. And I don't mean that in any degrading way at all. I just mean it's simple language in what we're saying, right? And so that's a reason for choosing that. But I just wanted to kind of present that today. I don't know where you are on that spectrum. Like I said, I've been around the church for a long time. I've been in places where people almost just went to blows over, you know, what translation of, of the Bible you're going to use in English, you know, I, when, again, when you start working in missions and you realize you're going to present Scripture in Thai rather than in English, you know, it kind of brings you back to the idea this whole thing is just translated into all these different languages. That's the whole point, is to get the word into the common language of the people. Now, to dial you back in from where I'm going with that, there are two terms that we're dealing with today. Malak Elohim, which means the angel of the Lord, and Malak Jehovah, or Malak Yahweh. Malak being the Hebrew term for angel, and Elohim for Lord, and Jehovah or Yahweh as the name of God. So we're looking at these terms, and we're going to be looking at scripture that uses both terms. However, with Malak Elohim, there is a definite article when that appears in the Old Testament text, the. With Malak Jehovah, because it has the name of God associated with it, that's already implied that you're talking about this specific character. Now, your English translations may vary, and it surprises me when I was going back and studying this week at how they'll flip sometimes from saying the to a. So, we're just going to walk through some of these, not to make the point of that, but on scriptures, if you can trust me this morning that I've researched this out, and if you have questions, come back and ask me later. And the notes are all in new version, the verses that I'm looking at, you're welcome to look at those as well. Now, as I mentioned each week, it's really difficult to cover these topics without covering a lot of Scripture, and so I've got quite a few passages and verses of Scripture for you again today, so put your seatbelt on, hang on, here we go. The angel of the Lord, or the angel of God. First thing I want to present to you this morning is the idea that this is more than an angel. I think the term angel is very misleading to us when we look 
at these passages of Scripture. There is a celestial being described in Scripture as the angel of the Lord or the angel of God from, that appears from the time of Abraham until the time of the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah's book is the second to last book in the Old Testament, right before Malachi. And in period of time, you know, the, the Old Testament books are not all chronological. The early ones are chronological, and then the prophets are put in as greater and lesser prophets. But you can follow their timelines through there, too. But Zechariah is towards the end of the Old Testament period. So we find these references. More than 50 references to the angel of the Lord over this period of time. And it's correspondent to the time of the revelation of God's plan of salvation, but prior to the coming of Christ. I think that's very significant for us in what God is doing and what he's up to. The title is distinct from just Malak, which is angel, which we find many times in Scripture, because it adds to it. It's specific about what angel this is. And it's also very different from Bene Elohim that we've talked about before that was the term sons of, of the Lord, sons of the Lord or sons of God, that is often referred to for angels as we've seen before. Now, if we go back to where this all starts in Genesis 16, we first see the angel of the Lord as he appears to Hagar. You remember who Hagar is? This is all the way back to the story of Abraham and Sarah. And God has made promises to Abraham about having a child. And he and Sarah are getting older and there's no sign of a child. And Sarah finally gets tired of this and she says, you know, I've got this, this handmaiden, this servant of mine named Hagar. And she's young and healthy and viable and I'm going to give her to you and you, you take her as, a, as another wife and she's going to bear children. But the child she bears is going to be for me, for us, to fulfill God's promise. Now, how many of you know it's really not good to try to help God along in what he's doing? Okay, if you haven't learned that before, look carefully at this story. It is not good to try to help God do what you think God needs to do. But they do. Abraham consents to this and Hagar becomes pregnant with a child. Sarah then becomes very unhappy and Hagar becomes apparently a little contemptuous of Sarah in the middle of this. And so there's a battle in the household. Abraham... Uh, kind of sidesteps the issue. Guys, this is one of the flaws we often have when conflict arises. We can step back instead of stepping up. And I think in this story, Abraham steps back. And he just steps back and says, she's your servant, you do with her what you want. Not a very manly way to address the situation, but it happens. Anyway, Sarah begins to mistreat Hagar, so she runs away out into the wilderness. And she's out there, and it says that the angel of the Lord appears to her. And begins to speak to her. And begins to address her. And in verses, uh, Genesis 16, 7 through 10, and then we're going to skip to verse 13. It says, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Side note, you can take away from this in the idea of covenant. Covenant is a powerful thing in Scripture. Covenant is a bond. It's more than a promise and way more than a contract. When we make a contract, contracts are built around liability and the limits of that liability, what you're obligated to, and if somebody else breaks the contract, whoop, I'm free, I'm out, I'm, I'm done. Or you owe me something. Covenant is not like that. Covenant is when you make a promise and you pledge yourself to something without limitation. And it really doesn't matter whether the other person comes through or not. You chose to pledge yourself and promise yourself to something. That's the idea of, like, marriage is a covenant. We promise and we pledge ourselves. It's not a contractual arrangement. It's a covenant that we make. God made covenants with us in his relationship with us. And in his relationships with us, that's where we find, even though we may be unfaithful, God, God remains faithful. Because he can't deny himself and he's in a covenant with us. Now what you see with that, he'd made a covenant with Abraham about what he was going to do through Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless you and your descendants and they're going to be multiple. Well, now there's another descendant in the picture. Because they put this other woman in the picture. And so he makes a similar promise to Hagar. as what he's making to Abraham and Sarah. This descendant is going to have multiple descendants. Whole other story for another day to follow that up. But anyway, that's there. 
But we see this angel of the Lord appearing to her. And what I really want you to catch out of this is he promises to do things for her that only God can do. Do you see that in what he's speaking to her? He goes on, if you read this passage in its length, he's speaking prophetically about this child and what this child is going to be and what he's going to do and what his life is going to be like. And he's pronouncing this promise of blessing, of abundance, of of offspring. This is something only God can do. Hold on to that. A couple chapters later in Genesis 18, we're told that three men, describes them as three men, appear to Abraham by the place where he is camped in his tents. And Abraham goes out and speaks to them. I think Abraham has an immediate awareness of the presence of God that he's met with before. And so he invites them in and offers them hospitality and and begins talking with them. And this is the visit where the visitors have come to Abraham and they tell him one thing that next year, about a year from this time, Sarah's going to have a child. And they also begin to tell him, I've heard things about Sodom and Gomorrah and I've come down to see. And if it's as wicked as what I've heard, I'm going to destroy it. And so in this passage, Abraham, because Lot is there, he begins to intercede for the city. And he says, oh, God, what if there's there's righteous people there? You wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked, would you? What if there's 50 righteous people in the city? And God says, if there are 50 righteous people in the city, I won't destroy it. But what if there's 45? I won't do it. What if there's 40, 35? He keeps pressing and taking it down until he finally gets down to 10. What if there's 10 righteous people in the city? And the Lord says, if there are even 10 righteous people in the city, I'll not destroy it. But in this story, we find that these three visitors come and they're described as men, two of them specifically referred to as angels along the way. In fact, only the two angels are the ones that actually go into Sodom. And we've talked about that story already and what happens there with the men of the city and how they get Lot out. And, and so we've talked about some of that. But we find that specifically one of these was the Lord as it refers to the Lord talking to Abraham. So we have the presence of the Lord. That's called a theophany. The presence of God manifest in that way. Hold on to that. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 2 tells us that the angel of the Lord appears to Moses in the flames of fire as it appears to be a burning bush. Verse 4 says that God called to him from the bush and on this occasion reveals himself through that story as I am that I am. Exodus 3 verses 2 and skipping to verse 4. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire it did not burn up. Verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Presence of God. I'm wanting you to see the associations between this angel and the presence of God. Judges chapter 6 verse 12 we read that the angel of the Lord comes and appears to Gideon. In fact he comes and sits down under a tree and he's waiting and as Gideon is there working he begins to speak to Gideon. And in Judges 6 11 and 12 and then in verse 14 it says the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites, who kept coming and raiding the land and taking all the good stuff. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And in verse 14, after Gideon kind of reacts to that, it says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? One more. In Judges 13, The angel of the Lord appears to Samson's parents, a man named Manoah and his wife who was barren and had not had a child and tells tells her that she's going to have a child, Uh, meets just her first and then Manoah begins to pray and says, God, would you send the, the man back that spoke to my wife and give us instructions about this child that we're going to have? And so sure enough, comes and appears again and she goes and gets her husband and says, he's here, come, come meet him. And uh, as they're talking with him and getting instructions, Manoah says, Stay with us and let us prepare some food and an offering and so forth. And he says, I won't eat your food. And he says, but if you want to make an offering, you can and I'll stay. But he says, you need to make this offering to the Lord. And uh, interesting as he does that. And 
In Judges 13, verses 20 to 22, it tells us this. As the flame blazed on the offering, as the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. And seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. And when the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. And he says this, we are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. Uh, one last one in this area that I want to share with you. Let's zip all the way over towards the end of the Old Testament in Zechariah. In Zechariah, fi- we find references to the angel of the Lord in chapter 1 and chapter 3. Chapter 3, I want to go to first. In Zechariah 3 and verse 1, we see the angel of the Lord. We're also going to see Satan. This is another one of the appearances we see of Satan in his role as accuser. As we see him in Job and as we read about him in other places. And in verse 2, it suddenly says that it is the Lord speaking. Zechariah 3, 1 and 2. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord then said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now, it's interesting there, the transition that happens in these passages where it mentions the angel of the Lord and then it refers to the Lord speaking. Also, we find in this passage where it says the Lord is speaking to the Lord, basically. Jehovah is speaking to Jehovah. Very interesting to see. What I want to say to you out of this is that each of these is a theophany, as I mentioned a moment ago. Theophany is a word that very simply means a manifestation of the presence of God in a physical form. Manifestation of the presence of God in a physical form. We've seen that angels can manifest themselves in a physical form like a man, like a person. And so we see in a similar way the very presence of God in these passages of Scripture. Now, while I wanted you to see that, what I want you to see from this and kind of where we left off, we need to continue a little bit more with these ideas in Zechariah, is it a distinct person of God. We can observe and learn more about this presence of God in his interactions. Backing up to Zechariah chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, uh, Zechariah has a vision of a man among the myrtle trees. He's uh, got a horse and he's with the, the, in the myrtle trees and he's dispatching other beings with horses in the midst of what's going on. But it refers to the angel of God to whom the horseman Uh, the Lord has sent out report back to and who intercedes for Jerusalem. Let me read you the passage. Zechariah chapter 1 verses 10 to 12 says, Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, These are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, We have gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and in peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? And so we find the one in the middle of the myrtle trees is the one these other angels are reporting back to. These angels come and report to him. And he also speaks out as an intercessor. And yet it's Jehovah speaking to Jehovah again. Very interesting. Zechariah 3 that we looked at a moment ago, he stands in opposition to Satan the accuser and calls upon the Lord. The angel called Jehovah is speaking to Jehovah. We saw that. Um, This seems confusing in a way, right? And yet it doesn't. Because this makes sense if this is not only a theophany, but a Christophany. If this is a Christophany, a Christophany being a manifestation of the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, before his incarnation. The Word of God is plain in telling us that Jesus has been there from the beginning. That God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity that we recognize were present in creation, have been there from the beginning, have a perfect unity together. So the Son has always been. In Revelation, we read about him as being the lamb slain from the foundations of the world before it was even necessary, God's preparation in this plan. But this all makes sense if this is a Christophany, a manifestation of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ before his incarnation. The Son of God is the visible God of the New Testament. We recognize that. When Jesus comes, God is is 
it's God put on flesh and become like us, right? He is the God-man. He is the presence of God, the very essence of God with us. It also stands to reason that he is the visible manifestation of God in the Old Testament as well. Just not known as he will be known in the time to come. The angel of the Lord, it's interesting to note, no longer appears after Christ's incarnation. No more appearance of the angel of the Lord. That time is done. New Testament references that appear similar and say angel of God are in Greek. I studied Greek. Hebrew is not my thing, but Greek I have. And in those references, there is never a definite article. It's never the angel of the Lord. The New Testament references are always a or an angel of the Lord. A more generic expression that takes place there. We never see the Father or the Spirit take a bodily form as a person like that. In fact, in John 1.18, we read where Jesus says, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. He has made him known. It makes all kinds of sense. This is the presence of God, but it's the second person of the Trinity. It's Jesus that is making these appearances and involved in all these things. And I don't know about you, but I see a great beauty in seeing Jesus at work. If you've ever wondered, well, where was Jesus all this time while all these things were going on, building up to this? Why does he not show up until we get way over here? Jesus has been there from the beginning. And he's been at work for our salvation from the beginning. He's been at work in the plan of God from the beginning and through all of these stories that we know about in the Old Testament. Consider Jesus' words to the Pharisees in John 8, 56 to 59. It strikes me very interesting after reading what we've been reading this morning. In this passage, he's talking to the Pharisees and they're arguing about Abraham and about who Jesus is. And Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. They looked at him and said, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? His response, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered before Abraham was born. I am. Profound statement. And if it was his presence in the bush in the first place that said, I am that I am, representing the Godhead. And here he is and talking about Abraham, who he met with by the tent to tell him the things that he was doing and heard Abraham interceding for the city of Sodom. What if there's ten righteous people in the city? And his response, if there's ten, I won't destroy it. And he makes this statement. And I tell you what, they knew what he was saying too, because the next verse after that says that this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus himself slipped away from them, from the temple grounds. We also know in Scripture, looking forward in the New Testament, that Jesus is the captain of the hosts of heaven. You think about that vision in Zechariah where he's giving orders to the horsemen who are going out and reporting back to him. And in Revelation 19 and 11 and following, we read where John says, I saw heaven standing open and I saw one sitting on a horse. And he leads the armies of heaven. And we know he's writing about Jesus and his return in that passage and the things that are to come. He is the commander and the captain of heaven's hosts. Let me draw you into this a little bit. And I I won't keep throwing uh, so many things up there. But all these scripture references are in, in the notes if you want to have them. There's a consistent ministry that takes place here that I think we need to make note of. The ministries of the angel of the Lord and the ministries of Christ as we recognize them in the New Testament are parallel and demonstrate God's love and plan for us from beginning to end. Again, that Jesus has been at work all this time. The angel of the Lord has a purpose in Revelation. In Exodus chapter 3, as we talked about it, he discloses the name of God, presents, I am that I am, a revealer of God's nature and God's purpose. We find the same of Jesus in John chapter 1. When it's writing about the son came into the world and his own did not receive him. But he came to reveal God, to show us God, to show us who he is and what his plan is about. Colossians 2, we did our study in Colossians a while back that presents him as the very presence of God revealed to us. Hebrews chapter 1 that says God made revelation through all these other ways. But in the last days he's revealed himself by his son. Commissioning. We find again in Exodus 3 that 
uh, he calls Moses and sets him to work. In Judges 6, it's Gideon as he commissions him to be a judge and to deliver Israel. In Judges 13, it's Samson through his parents as he gives instructions for here's what the, the boy's life and calling is to be about. In the New Testament, it's us. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority on heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all the nations. John 20, 21, as he says, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you the ministry of commissioning us to go. Deliverance. The angel delivered God's people from their enemies, and Jesus delivers us from sin and death, the enemies of our soul. Protection. The angel represented God's protective presence. Psalm 34, verse 7, a passage I didn't have another way to work in, but wanted you to hear. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. 2 Kings 19, 35, another passage I didn't have time to really work through the story, but it's a time when Sennacherib has come and encamped against, uh, against the nation, and it's in King Hezekiah's time, and he's threatening to destroy them. He's got an army of 185,000 soldiers around the city, and Hezekiah gets on his face and says he takes the letter from Sennacherib telling them to surrender or they're going to die. He goes to the temple, he puts it before the Lord, and he says, God, what are you going to do about this? May our prayers be like that. God, what are you going to do about this? Take the stuff you need. Take the stuff that's on your mind. Take the stuff that worries you. Instead of racking your brain trying to figure it out and calling every other advisor you can think of and finding every book, self-help book and whatever else, take it to God. Put it out there and say, God, what are you going to do about this? And God, in answer to Hezekiah's prayer, the angel of the Lord comes and wipes out 185,000 soldiers like that. And Sennacherib turns around and goes home in shame. The defender. Jesus is the promise of God's protective presence with us. He promised he would be with us always. Hebrews 13.5 tells us, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. No one can snatch us out of his hand. He's got us. Intercession. The angel of the Lord interceded for Israel. Back to Zechariah 1, 12 and 13. God, how long? The 70 years are past. It's time. And it says in the next verse that God began to speak kindly about the nation and their restoration. Jesus is our high priest, we're told in Hebrews, whoever intercedes for us. Hebrews 7, 25. Advocacy. He's an advocate against the accusations of Satan. We saw that in Zechariah 3, 1 through 7, and he's our advocate as well. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Confirmation of the covenant. The angel confirmed the covenant with Abraham. Another great story we have time to spend a lot of time in, but Genesis 22. If you remember the movie we watched uh, a few months ago about his only son, talking about when God tells Abraham, Isaac finally comes. They finally get that baby when they're old and nobody thinks it's possible. He grows up to be about 12 years old and God says, by the way, I want you to take him up on a mountain and sacrifice him to me. What? And so he goes. And when Abraham acts in faith and obedience at the last moment, God says, stop. And he's provided a ram caught by its horns in the thicket, and he sacrifices the ram instead. But in that moment, the angel of the Lord speaks to him. It's another passage and reaffirms the covenant that God has made with him. Jesus told us he came to fulfill the old covenant and to institute a new one. Matthew 5, 17, don't think that I've come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. He came to affirm the covenant. He also tells us in Matthew 26, uh, verse 28, this is a new covenant in my blood. I'm making a covenant with you. In Hebrews 9, 15, we read about him as a mediator of a new and better covenant. Comfort. The angel comforted Hagar. In Genesis 16, as we read about, Jesus came with comfort and blessing in the synagogue in his own hometown in Luke 4, 16 through 19. He quotes the passage from Isaiah about being the one, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news, healing for the sick, restoration, the binding up of the brokenhearted, comfort. And he ministered to the outcast. We see it in John 9, 35 through 38. Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, who they kick out. And Jesus goes and finds him and heals him. 
16, verses 1 through 4. Uh, John 16, 1 through 4, in Jesus' final words before he goes to the cross, one of those passages, his promises to us about his comfort for us. Judgment. The angel was an agent of God's judgment. First Chronicles 21, we've talked about this passage a few times. The angel of the Lord stands over Jerusalem to destroy it because of David's sin. Satan tempted David to count the people. He counted the people and God says, what judgment do you want? Do you want to fall before your enemies? Do you want he said, put me in the hands of God. At least he's merciful. And yet it says he sends the angel of the Lord and he's there with a sword drawn over the city of Jerusalem to destroy it. And David sees it. And he cries out to God, God, I, it was me. Destroy me, my family, not, not the sheep, not the people. And it says God relents from the judgment that he's bringing. But the angel of the Lord is an agent of judgment in that passage, and Jesus will carry out God's judgment. We see Jesus talking about it in the Gospels in Matthew 24 and 25 when he talks about the end times and what's to come. We see it in 2 Thessalonians 1. We see it in Revelation 5 and 6. He will bring about the wrath of God and judgment. That may tilt some people's thinking about Jesus when they think about him as being soft and kind. And it's almost, we almost have this plushy Jesus that can't be tough. You better remember the one that th turned over the tables in the temple and the one who comes with justice and judgment. He's gracious and loving and kind. He's also just and holy. Calling to faith and commitment. Another story we didn't have time for earlier, Genesis 31, 11 through 13, part of Jacob's story in the patriarchs. When he sets out and goes away and God meets him at Bethel, it says the angel of the Lord. The angel called Jacob in Genesis 31, 11 to 13. Certainly in the New Testament, Jesus calls us. Forgiveness and direction. Exodus 3, again, 20 and 21. God promises Moses that he'll be with them and lead them in the way that they're going, the direction that they need. He's there for them, for the forgiveness they need. Jesus ministered to us the same way. He came that we might be forgiven, and he came to lead us and help us to know how we ought to live. And the presence of God with us. The angel of the Lord is spoken of as that presence, you know, that cloud, that pillar of cloud and fire. <laughs> the angel of the Lord, the presence, God's presence with them. And certainly as Jesus comes and as we look forward to the Christmas season we're moving towards, he is Emmanuel, God with us. The very presence of God with us. The angel of the Lord is, is far more than any angel. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a misnomer in that regard. He is the divine presence of God manifest to carry out the plan of salvation for mankind. We see the beauty of God's working through him in both the Old Testament and the New. We have a deeper appreciation for the eternal Son of God and his ministry for us, his ongoing ministry on our behalf. And I hope just as you look at those passages and you think about those things, those 12 things we just went through that are a part of the ministry of, of the angel in the Old Testament and certainly the ministry of Jesus in the New Testament, God loves you. There's nothing that can take you farther than he can reach you. There's nothing that can keep him from extending his love and grace to you. There's nothing that can keep him from redeeming you. There's nothing that can keep him from upholding you and bringing you through. There's nothing that can keep him from fulfilling his promises to you. Take heart in that. God loves you and he's going to do everything that he's promised.